Big Mouth and welcome to the DCEU Daily. Remember, you can tag me on Twitter and follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mad. So today we're going to play a really good, exciting game. We are going to pretend we are the head of Warner Brothers Pictures back in about 2011, right? So it's 2011, right? And David Goyer and Christopher Nolan come to us, the head of Warner Brothers Pictures, and they say, well, we've got a bit of writer's block when it comes to The Dark Knight Rises, but we've come up with a really exciting idea for a Superman movie. It's set in the real world and this and that, and Zod comes to Earth, blah, blah, blah. So we, as the people that are in charge of Warner Brothers Pictures, say, Christopher Nolan, you've done brilliant for us with your Dark Knight trilogy. Can't wait for your third installment. So you're going to be directing and leading this brand new franchise. No, we're bringing in Zack Snyder, a director that's already divided audiences with Watchmen. Is that okay with you? Yeah, why not? Bring him in. I'm sure everything will be fine. So, you know, I love Zack Snyder, right? You know, I love the DCEU. You know, I love his films. It's not about that. We are the head of Warner Brothers Pictures. This is not about hate for Zack. This is about us being business people. So when Kevin Feige developed the MCU, he had this plan of a shared universe. It makes sense. It doesn't matter that Zack makes great movies. It doesn't matter that his cast are amazing. None of that matters. It matters as the heads of Warner Brothers Pictures, right? We've got to make the best decision for the business. Now, maybe, and this is a sad state of affairs and the way things are today, but because of the MCU, we have to look at that brand and say, give me some of that, right? But we can be a little bit more intelligent. We can actually create a family-driven franchise with adult themes as well. Something that Zack is capable of because he did it in his Justice League movie, but it's not something he really wants to do, right? Zack is an auteur. Zack wants his creative freedom. So if you're Christopher Nolan, right, you could have actually brought Zack in to do more adult movies, right? That everybody knows are adult movies like Logan. Probably not a Superman movie or a Superman themed movie. I want to swap his Man of Steel or his Superman for anything. I'm just telling you, we today are playing a game. We're playing Let's Pretend, right? So let's pretend. So anyway, Christopher Nolan says, no, I'm, give, I'm bringing in Zack Snyder. So me and you are saying, well, hang on a minute. We want someone running this franchise like, like Fade is doing. He gets his hands dirty. He's molding the clay. He's the showrunner, right? The ultimate showrunner. That's what we want you to do, Chris. Well, no, I want to do my other projects. You know what, Chris? No, we're not going to use your Superman idea. Um, we're not going to allow you to bring Zack Snyder in because it's not good for our business, right? We may bring Zack in to do some more adult-themed, hardcore, dark superhero stuff in the future. But, you know, this isn't what we want. No! Warner Brothers Pictures just kept on nodding their heads because they thought Christopher Nolan, money. But Christopher Nolan doesn't necessarily mean money. And when it comes to a DC extended universe, this wasn't the best idea. Now, out there right now, you're going to be saying, you Zack Snyder hater. No, it's not about hating Zack. It's about honesty, directness. It's about us pretending that we're the business, right? So, right. Zach and Chris and David create Man of Steel, right? Now, as you know, if you've been a fan or a subscriber or a viewer uh, to my channel and to, to my DCEU daily, daily episodes, you know I was never triggered by the killing of Zod. It never bothered me. It never affected me. But it is the most dumbest thing anyone's ever done as a business. I've got 10, 11 nephews and nieces combined together, right? So when Man of Steel was out, they were like two, three. So let's discuss the killing of Zod and why it's problematic. As I say, I'm not one of those people, Superman doesn't kill. And I understand what Zack says, you know, wake the fuck up. But you can't tell children to wake the fuck up. When I was watching Superman the movie as a kid, I wouldn't have been allowed to watch it 
if um, Christopher Reeve's Superman snaps Gene Hackman's uh, Lex Luthor's neck, right? Or Otis. Or Miss Tess Mica! You know, it, it, it wouldn't happen. It, it wouldn't work, right? So I would have been robbed of getting to know Superman. Now, millions of children like me got to know Superman. As a business, what do you think that did? It brought future Superman fans that would make money for Smallville, Superboy, um, uh, Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Potential. Money making potential. Because we're not just talking about us being in charge of an, an entertainment platform. We are a business. And this is what Disney and Fake have done. They're entertaining and they're a business and they excite people. It's not divisive. They've made divisive decisions. The Ed Norton situation is despicable. The Professor Hogg situation is despicable. But mostly they've made good decisions for their business, right? So again, let's have a deep dive into the killing of Zod. That means all your two free your, your two three year olds to ten year olds, or uh, maybe ten year olds can watch it, but they shouldn't really be seeing someone snapping someone's neck. Not as kind of vicious as that, right? Are we all agreed on that? Kids can't watch Man of Steel. They can't look up to Henry Superman. You've already taken away um, a future potential audience, and you've taken away repeat viewings. This is why Man of Steel didn't make over a billion dollars. Because it's an amazing Superman film. It's an awesome Superman film. And I watch it all the time. And I watch the trailers. And I love that movie. It's not about like or hate. We are at the head of a business here today. So we can't just be Zach fanboys and girls, right? Or whatever else you identify as. We are a business. And we've got to look at this as a business. Parents couldn't take their kids back to watch it again. And again, families couldn't go and watch it. And the biggest money-making audience are families, right? And as I said before, good writers and good creatives can create child-friendly content with adult themes, right? But Snyder doesn't want to do that. Goya doesn't want to do that. They're not those type of storytellers. And that's fair enough. So you don't bring them on. It's simple. As a business, you can't do that. But there's another problem with The Killing of Zod. It doesn't hold any consequences afterwards, after that moment, in the very film, Man of Steel, nothing happens. They go more jokey. Oh, I think he's kind of hot. I like that sequence. Nothing wrong with it. We go to Superman. We took Clark and Lois, and we have a bit of banter at the Daily Planet. Then it's finished, right? Then we go to BVS, where the killing of Zod, or Superman's consequences of killing Zod, are never discussed. Now, Batman versus Superman goes down this very direct kind of narrative and theme of people not trusting Superman. What a better way of people not trusting Superman than the killing of Zod. But what? And I've mentioned this on this channel many times. If Superman's got the opportunity to kill again in a similar scenario and he says, I know what it's like to kill. I killed one of my own people. I never want to feel that way again. And then you explain why this Superman doesn't kill any longer. And you actually have a proper reason for it. David Goyer, whose idea it was for a Superman to kill Zod, not Zack Snyder, by the way, let's get that absolutely clear, right? Does it for effect. He does it for shock value. There's actually no point of it happening. You can defend it. I can defend it to a blue in our faces. In terms of the narrative, yes, Soups has got no choice. In the story, he has to kill Zod. We all understand that. We're not children. We get it, right? But as a business, this simply doesn't work. It doesn't work whatsoever. So as a business, you've already triggered diehard Superman fans, diehard DC Comics fans, a lot of people. This is where the toxicity comes for Zach. This is where it all comes from, right? Rightly or wrongly, this is where it comes from. So already you've lost a major part of your audience. There's a negative um, outlining of people's attitudes towards you as a filmmaker, which is wrong because Zach made a great movie and Goya wrote a great movie, right? And Goya and Nolan wrote the story together, right? And Goya wrote the script. It's great and everything, but that film... As Zach said about his Justice League movie to Scott Mendelssohn, you said 
that the theatrical cut of Justice League was like a Saturday morning cartoon. And this film is for adults. There lies the problem. I don't have a I don't have an issue that Zack's an auteur and he wants to make adult superhero movies. That's not the issue. But for today, we're running Warner Brothers Pictures. Now, do you see what position these people are in? Right? Do you understand as a business? It's very, very difficult. Very difficult. Us as fans, restore the Snyderverse, restore the Snyderverse. Yes, I want that. And you want that. I was tagging yesterday all day. Of course I want that. I still want that. But you see how it's complex and how as a business, it simply doesn't work to say, fuck the kids, fuck the Superman the movie crowd. As a business, that simply doesn't work. Whether you like it or not, these are the facts, right? This is the mistake of the very core and the origins of the DC Extended Universe. Then you go to BVS. Now, Man of Steel's got lots and lots of levity. In fact, Henry's Superman and Clark smiles a lot. But in Batman vs. Superman, it's like we've gone from that kind of levity to something totally different. And I love BVS. I do as a film. I love it. But again, as a business, the film is a killer. Can we all agree? No matter how much we love Zack and that film and MOS, right, and his Justice League movie, can we agree that that's a killer for a franchise? That film is a killer. Because it only appeals to a certain member of the audience. Is that true or is that false, right? So we're talking about, um, as a business, because we're the head of Warner Brothers Pictures today, right? And we're saying, as a business, that's perfectly fine. We are kill off half of our profits, right? You can't do that. You can't do that. And this was the problem. As much as I love those movies... And as much as I don't want to lose those movies, as the head of Warner Brothers Pictures, those movies shouldn't have happened. That Superman snaps Zod's neck. And we've got a somber indie type of movie in BVS. A beautiful movie. Uh, the young cut version. The ultimate edition. It's beautiful. I love it. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm going to lose a lot of subscribers about this. Over this. Right? But it doesn't really matter because, let's put it this way, I'm not a successful YouTube channel. I'm quite happy to speak to myself. I'm giving you my opinion because we're doing something interesting now. Why the DCEU is wrecked from its very inception? Because we've got these great two movies, BVS and Batman vs. Superman. But as a business, as if we want to echo what the MCU have done, not in the type of films that they've done. I am not saying that we, as the DCEU and the head of Warner Brothers Pictures, should have done what Fave did. Smiley, happy, bright, funny, you know, someone dies and we crack a joke. I'm not talking about that. But still, in Man of Steel, and this is Goya's fault, after Superman snaps Zod's neck, there's lots of levity. Nobody, Superman doesn't seem bothered anymore. At the time when he does it, he seems, it's great acting from Henry and it's a great moment, well directed by Zack. But after that moment, it's never discussed again. Superman killed someone, right? Superman killed someone. Whether it was Zod, and this is interesting as well. I'll, I'll, I'll give you something else which is kind of hypocritical from Goya in Man of Steel. When Zod kills Jor-El, he looks regretful. When he breaks the artificial intelligence and Jor-El can't speak to him anymore, you can see in the actor's eyes, he regrets it. There's regret. He's killed someone and this villain actually feels bad for it, right? But after Superman kills the very same character we're talking about, yes, at that moment when he kills him, there's remorse and regret and it affects him. But after a cuddle from Lois, it's all over. I'm sorry. Even as a biased Zack Snyder DCEU fan, I have to call that into question. And that's not Zack, that's David Goyer. So did you notice that David Goyer wasn't involved with the DCEU after Man of Steel? Because the script that he wrote was re rewritten by Chris Terrio, as we know. That's why he, you're saying his name's on BVS. Yeah, they had to credit him. He had nothing to do with BVS. His script was rewritten by Chris Terrio. Fact, he was removed. They blamed Goya 
for man of still not making a billion dollars for the very reasons I've just explained. Because what you've got to understand is Warner Brothers Pictures want to make great entertainment, but they want to make money. They want a fr They understand one thing that we all understand for crying out loud, that the DC IP is one of the most profitable potentially. And potentially, if you do all your maths together, it should be more profitable than anything in the MCU. In fact, apart from Spider-Man and the Hulk, Superman and Batman should be making over a billion dollars a picture. That's a fact. You can defend it as much as you want. But Marvel don't have other characters like this. But their movies make more money. You know why? Because Fake's smart. He created films for a family audience. There was a couple that are kind of adult, like Captain America, um, The Winter Soldier. An amazing film. It's shocking because of how lightweight the rest of the franchise is in terms of appealing to kids and families. But that afforded them the right to do a darker movie. Do you understand? Right? So, right. That's my point of view on the DCEU as a businessman. As someone himself who wants to um, develop and create his own production company. Because even though I'm a storyteller, I also want to make money, right? I mean, I know that some, uh, some people make that sound like a crime today. And this is the quandary that Warner Brothers Pictures are in. So they've made a lot of mistakes. And the first mistake was actually saying, oh, Christopher Nolan, billions of dollars. Yeah, we'll bring him on, even though he doesn't want to get his hands dirty, mold the clay. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It's not fine, right? And basically, the the leaders of the old um, Warner Brothers regime are to blame. They saw an easy situation, a big name, because this is what Hollywood is. Nolan was a big name. People loved him for Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. What could possibly go wrong? What went wrong is if Chris was running this thing himself, I think maybe we could have had something quite kind of interesting. But with or without Snyder directing Man of Steel, Man of Steel is just, it's the same movie. The only difference is, is visually, it's not like Zach does things, um, and the style you're seeing visually, right? Mostly, Zach wasn't involved in the narrative of Man of Steel. He's involved in the rest of the narrative, like Batman versus Superman and the Snyder Cut, I agree. But in terms of the story, he's not involved in that. He, you know, Chris and David are leading the story in Man of Steel. There's something that you've all got to understand. So whatever happens, that film is the way it is, apart from how you see it, right from the director's eye. That's important to understand. So, as I say, I love Zach, and you must believe me, I'm a fan, and I, I'm, not, I'm not an enemy, you know? I'm a friend, I'm not an enemy. But we're talking here today about business and how to run it properly. So we're going to go back. We're not going to get Christopher Nolan and David Goyer's story. We're not even going to do the way it was done because we don't know it was done that way. We're going to start again. And we are going to bring in somebody smart who understands the comic industry, but understands in transferring things into live action. That's what we're going to do, right? So we have to bring someone in to, that understands the elements of making great films and, and great media, but also understands the characters and loves these characters. That's exactly what Kevin Feige is. And to be honest with you, I don't know who I would bring in from the comics industry. I do not know. You would think that Jeff Johns is the right man for the job, but Jeff Johns got the gig. But unfortunately, once Jeff Johns got the gig, Batman versus Superman and Man of Steel already out there. Something that Jeff doesn't believe in already. Already, Jeff Johns is the villain of the story because he wants to go against an all-tour director. But beyond that, beyond that, Jeff Johns has been involved with some very, very interesting live action. Stargirl. People love Stargirl. His Smallville written episodes, very, very popular. So Jeff Johns, we don't know. We don't know if Jeff Johns could have created a great central universe. So should we put Jeff Johns in charge of the DCEU, right? Let's imagine he's in charge. He brings in these directors. Problem is, if we do that, it, the guy brought in Joss Whedon. But here's the thing. It, Joss Whedon 
wouldn't have been under the pressure he was if he just started again, right? And we don't know if he would have brought Joss Whedon in, right? I'm just saying. Or he would have brought other people in, right? We don't know. But we know that Jeff Johns probably liked the idea of Shazam and liked the material. But that is a reaction to Man of Steel and Batman versus Superman. That's something we've got to understand. So I don't know which comic book person we put in charge of the DCEU. But I'm going to go down to DC Comics and I'm going to say, who's ambitious? Who wants to run this live action franchise? Who has got the key skills to do this? And we put them in. We don't go to Walter Hamada because Walter Hamada knows jack shit about comics, right? So we get the right person, whether it's Jeff Johns or anyone. And we get in a director, I don't know who. I don't know who, but there's a lot of directors that have always wanted to make a Superman movie. We start with Superman. We do a great Superman movie, which Man of Steel already is, by the way. We all, we all agree, agree on that. We have a great Superman movie that kind of, you know, balance, straddles the line of the dark and the light and makes a great Superman movie, right? Anyone, I don't know who we'd get to do it. So then we do a Batman movie, right? Older Batman, younger Batman, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if it's Ben Affleck or not, right? Again, Jesse Eisenberg's a great Lex Luthor. Doesn't really appeal to audiences as Lex Luthor. That's the problem. I think he's a great Lex Luthor. He just doesn't appeal, right? So I don't know if you cast him or not. It doesn't matter, basically, because you're going to be going at this thing very, very differently anyway. So we have a Batman movie. Um, with, we don't do BVS. But you know what? Superman can have a cameo in the Batman movie. We can see him. Uh, we can see him, Bruce Wayne, introduce himself to Clark Kent. And slowly Bruce Wayne is investigating and finds out who he is or something. So we're creating the kind of pebbles of a shared universe, right? So Batman has his movie. You can do whatever you want with that. You do not. Listen to me. I like David Ayer. And I do like that weird cut of Suicide Squad. But there's no way you do, a, you know, you don't put Suicide Squad as the third movie. No, the third movie has to be Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, Batman and Superman are the top three. I don't think anyone can say anything else. People love them. So you do the Wonder Woman movie. Hey, use Patty Jenkins. Why not? I mean, obviously that film's not going to be as awesome as 2017 because Zach had a lot of involvement. Who knows? Maybe they would have used the same people. Maybe Wonder Woman 2017 isn't as much Zack as I think, but I know that the fighting choreography and his VFX team were there, which makes a big difference anyway. So we bring in whoever, probably a female director to keep everyone quiet, yeah? <laughs> Going to get in trouble here, isn't I? And uh, we have an awesome Wonder Woman movie. Problem is, probably not Gal Gadot because Zack wasn't involved. So, you know, it's the pluses and the minuses, isn't it? But you get someone else in, right? And we can still pull off a, a kind of a half decent Wonder Woman movie. Then, then what you do is um, you do a cyborg movie, then a Flash movie, and whoever else. And I think fi the final movie would be probably for me Green Lantern. So a lot of people have had this debate: should of Zach did standalone movies first? Well, we have to get this um, elephant out of the room and just tell you this: Zack Snyder didn't decide to go from Man of Steel to BVS. They wanted Batman and Superman to fight in the second movie because they were concerned um, of because of Man of Steel not making a billion dollars. This was the issue. So they thought, a lazy trick, chuck Batman in there, right? Everyone's going to be pleased and happy. Zack, you can do it. We liked what you did in Man of Steel because remember, um, Zack Snyder didn't do the story and didn't decide to kill off Zod. So they've still got confidence in, confidence in Zack before BVS. BVS is the chain reaction that, from the studio's point of view, that really made things worse. Everyone was making things worse, right? As a business, don't forget, we are running this thing now. And so, basically, you've got all these... Um, so, as I say, it was the studio who didn't want to do standalones. They were rushing. They wanted to rush to Justice League. So, you have BVS, Suicide Squad. There's no point doing a Suicide Squad as a third movie because they're not going to have anything to do... With the Justice League. Now, if you did it, if you first Justice League, actually, isn't that a good idea, my fellow heads of Warner Brothers Pictures? Actually, you 
you could do a Suicide Squad movie as the final movie before Justice League. Right. So you do your Cyborg, your Green Lanterns, you do your Aquaman and all the rest of it, the Flash, all of them, right? You, you do standalones for all these characters. Then you do Suicide Squad. And what you do is you build the Suicide Squad as the enemies of the Justice League. So that your first Justice League movie is a big event. Because you develop your Harley Quinns, Margot Robbies and Will Smiths and all of these people, right? Jared Leto as the Joker. And in your Justice League movie, you do a Justice League versus the Suicide Squad. Now, I love Zack Snyder's Justice League, Snyder Cut. But by having it as the Suicide Squad, you have it as this kind of realistic, kind of relatable, you know, villains fighting the heroes, right? They saved the world in the Suicide Squad. But now Waller is using them to fight the Justice League, right? Because she wants to be in control of heroes, right? And she wants to take the Justice League down so she can control them. So she uses her members of the Suicide Squad to do it. So you've got this epic Justice League versus a Suicide Squad movie. And it really makes sense. Uh, so basically, we wouldn't have killed Superman, right? Because again, when I see BVS and Superman dies, I feel emotional. It works for me. But yes, of course, I think from any writing school or film school, no one's going to advise you to kill Superman in the second movie. And here's my problem with the whole killing of Superman in BVS. It's great. But then when you bring him back to life, it's not as good as, let's say, how the comics did it. It's different versions of Superman. It's really epic. He comes back to life. He fights the Justice League. Then all he needs is Lois and he's all right. This is me, as I say. I love Zach. I have to keep on repeating this because people get, go off on one. But we're a business here, right? We're a business. We're not all about all tour directors. The comic book franchise isn't about all tour directors. It's about making money, entertaining people, and going on to the next film. That's what any franchise does. That's what the Bond franchise did, right? Anyway, so you you've got you've got this. You, you, you basically you've got Justice League versus the Suicide Squad. It really works for me. I think it's gritty, down-to-earth characters, no supernatural element. Um, obviously, there has to be, if you've got Superman in a Justice League movie, he could easily fucking wipe out the Suicide Squad. So the Suicide Squad are going to need something a bit extra. Um, may, maybe they, 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 they tie Superman down. But this is a good idea. If you want to see the evil Superman element, element give him Red K. The Suicide Squad... Douse Superman with Red K, which obviously makes it a more equal fight. In fact, Superman takes their side. How about that? Fellow heads of Warner Brothers, they douse him in Red K. Now, in a Smallville TV show, I don't know about the comics, that makes him bad, right? So, basically, he joins them because he just cares about profit and stuff. So, he's, he's Waller's bitch now, right? So... Without Superman, the Justice League have really got a fight on their hands because this is also the movie they get together, get to know each other. So all of a sudden, you've got this, right? So you've got this first Justice League movie. You've already had the Suicide Squad movie. The whole thing works. It's interconnected, right? You've had your standalone movies. Everyone's excited about this platform. Not just half the audience, all the audience. As business people, that's how it works, right? All of a sudden, you've had all your first movies, you've had your Justice League movie. Now, what you could do, you could take a break. Basically, we leave those characters in a little bit of um, maybe a self-contained cliffhanger for the next time or something, right? You could even have Dark Side all of a sudden come to Earth, but then maybe you deal with something else. Maybe you leave that storyline for a little bit, right? And then you start focusing on other Earths, right? Or you go back in time and you, you you focus on the Justice Society of America and give them an origin story, right? Then maybe these people can cross over somehow via time travel. I don't know. So all of a sudden, you start at one end of the DC universe, then you go to the, the Justice Society, and it gets very exciting. And maybe before the first Justice League movie, you even have a Shazam standalone movie, not after Justice League. doesn't make sense, does it? Because one of the problems... With this DCEU, with Snyder and Johns sniping at each other, Snyder wants it one way and Johns wants it the other. There's, you can have, we, we can be in this room, we can be in this conference room plotting out the DCEU and how we're going to develop it, 
but you can't be so opposite that you can't come together and compromise as a team of people what's best for the film, what's best for profits, what's best for the fans, what's best for the IP. And these people were only thinking about, and I'm sorry, still a Zack Snyder fan, but they were only thinking about their own points of view and not what's best, ultimately, right? For bringing in everyone so everyone can enjoy this. You know, this could be family friendly, but if you're clever, you can have adult themes in it as well, right? Superman the movie is, is, attracts families, but it has adult themes in it, right? Because we see Superman drowning. We see Lois Lane dead, for Christ's sake, and Superman at his lowest, screaming to the heavens. There's, that's more of an adult theme. Now, there's not a lot of those in there, but you can see you could do more of that. It could be half and half. If you're smart, you can do these things. Today, we're thinking about the business, right? This is what I want you guys. I know you're not happy with me. You probably already left the video, but today we're talking about this as a business. And as a business, having Zack Snyder lead the whole thing isn't going to work. As a, as a filmography, it's awesome, and I love his plan, and I would have loved to see the whole thing, and I hope we still do. But ultimately, as a business, and as someone who's from the industry understands that, and the quandary that Warner Brothers Pictures are in, and this is why they're doing Flashpoint, because they're going to attempt to do in Flashpoint what I'm suggesting I would have done right from the very beginning. I don't know if they can pull it off. Half of me wants them to, half of me doesn't. That's the way I I'm at. So, yeah, you start with the Justice League. You do these individual movies. You have a Suicide Squad versus a Justice League movie. Then you leave a little cliffhanger there. And then you go back to the past and you basically create the Justice Society cinematic universe. That's all going to be connected in the end to the first part of the franchise we've done. But we focus on them. You can even have Black Adam meet in the Justice Society down the road. But you start those characters off, right? So you do whatever Flash was in the Justice Society and things like that. So then you do six movies of that, right? So all of a sudden you've got this huge franchise and that element will crash and meet that element and they've all got to fight Darkseid or it's a crisis on Infinite Earths or whatever. Do you understand? You build it up. You build it up and it's a mammoth thing, right? And everyone's happy because the families can go and watch it. The adults can go and watch it. Do you think it's only children and families and teenagers watching the MCU? No, they they make, a, what did they make? Two, two billion for Endgame? I don't know what they made for, for Endgame, right? A lot of money in Infinity War. There's a reason for that because every single fucker who likes films went to see them. Because today we're talking about us being business people and not, oh, Zach, you know, normally that's me. And I love the guy. Again, keep on repeating it. Because people haven't got the intellect to understand the difference of what we're doing here today, right? As a business, that's why the MCU works. They're not the best, greatest films ever. They're not, not better than the Back to the Future franchise. They're not better than the Star Wars franchise. They work. Because they do films that please the people while they're watching them. And then they cross over their favourite characters and their favourite characters meet. This is why they're doing it in Flashpoint. Because people like that shit. It doesn't have to be cohesive. It doesn't have to be the greatest writing or directing ever. People like this. People who have been reading comic books all their fucking lives have been reading crossovers and these things being set up, like I'm suggesting. Doing these Justice League origin stories, then having the Justice League fight the Suicide Squad, then doing that again, but with the Justice Society of America, setting a whole universe up, setting up the multiverse for a crisis on infinite Earths crossover right but you set it all up and you take your time right but there doesn't seem to be anyone at this damn company that understands that everything they do is lazy not rebooting the franchise after justice league is lazy right and i fought for Zack snyder's snyder cut right but the consequences of that are obvious we know we're going to say right we got the snyder cut we don't want any more and us wanting more complicates the main issue. Even if you're the most ardent Snyder fan, surely you understand that. So now the whole franchise, because it started as a business in the wrong way, and they never, ever said, right, enough's enough. This is where we were. So I actually really enjoyed doing this today. And that's how I was set up the DCEU. So if you're still a subscriber and you like that, Please come back and watch more videos. And if you haven't subscribed, 
please subscribe. Next, we hear from DC superfan Scott Edwards. Let's see what he's got to say today. Hello, is anyone there? Have you left me? I think I've got zero subscribers. Shit. Oh, well, I've been talking to myself since I was born. Doesn't really matter. Anyway, I'm sure Scott Edwards is watching because Scott Edwards understands different opinions. Anyway, this is from Scott Edwards at Movies TV Man. Thanks again for the shout out on the DCEU Daily. My pleasure. My questions for the next DCEU Daily are what do you seriously and legitimately think of Starro? Potentially being the main villain of the Suicide Squad movie. James Gunn's a Suicide Squad movie, of course. Well, um, I have a couple of weeks ago, Scott, uh, re read a Screen Rant article on this very show um, explaining Starro, Starro and his role on the show. Because originally I thought, what a shit idea this is. A starfish being the main villain of a superhero movie. But I understand he's got telepathy powers, telepathic powers. He can control people. Hopefully he's got some speech as well. If that's the case, he could be a very, very interesting villain. But I don't know enough about this character. I haven't experienced him in live action to know if this is a good idea or a bad idea. And Movies TV Mad, question two. I'm kind of confused on your opinion on Birds of Prey. I thought you initially really liked the movie the first time you saw it. Did you change your mind later? I would say it's a good movie. Great fights, action, and great action scenes. And I like all the characters. Right. I was able to see a test screening of Birds of Prey before anyone else was able to see it properly when it was released. I liked it. It was, I didn't think it was the best movie ever or anything like that. I thought it was solid. It was okay. I had a good time with it. Didn't think about it much afterwards. It was only when Ewan McGregor and people like that were saying, this film's commentating on toxic mas masculinity. And then I could see it in the film. That's when I started to dislike it a bit. I think it's a solid movie. It does its job. Some of the choreography is beautiful. I think it's an interesting film. It's entertaining. But, and I certainly think it's valid being part of the DCEU. Yeah, it's just not one of my favourite superhero films. And unfortunately, this constant commentary on this fiction that is toxic masculinity is very disappointing too. So this is um, Scott's final question. And finally, I really like Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, and I love Margot as an actress. What about you? I also really hope she sticks around as Harley for, for future movies, because she is literally perfect casting for that role. She's as perfect as Gal Gadot is, um, who actually announced yesterday she's uh, actually reading two scripts that she's been cast in. So I don't know what that's all about. I think one of them's obviously Cleopatra, another one's the Star Wars movie Patty Jenkins is doing. We'll see. So Margot is brilliant. Now, anyone, I don't know if you're from America, Scott, the UK, but a lot of people will know that Margot Robbie started off in the Australian soap Neighbours, one of the most popular things over in Europe, and she did really, really well, and then she came to Hollywood. Um, now, I like Margot Robbie, but again, she is obsessed with these gender politics, you know, this so-called toxic masculinity, and she's all about the girl power, right? Now... If you just focus your films on that and that's all you care about and how a character's dressed and oh, she obviously had issues how she was dressed in David Ayer's Suicide Squad. And I think um, certainly the studio took things too far with Margot. I like her as an actress. She's very talented. She's a great Harley. Whether she sticks around, Scott, is another matter entirely. She's going off with um, Christina Hodgson over to Disney to do this Pirates of the Caribbean reboot. Um, so I don't know if she's going to stick around, but we are heading for the multiverse. You can do recasts. Obviously, people are going to be upset because, as we've both said already, she's perfect casting. She's amazing in the role. James Gunn has said he really would like to do a Harley Quinn movie with her. So hopefully his take on Harley and them working together, developing her character in his Suicide Squad movie works out, then maybe we can get more. But I've also said before on this show and on this channel, it, it wouldn't surprise me if he kills her off, if she's decided enough's enough and she wants to leave. But why would she want to leave anyway? It's great for her career to keep on coming back and reprising an iconic character. Anyway, I hope that covers everything for you, Scott. Comment down below, like, share and subscribe. And if anyone stuck around for that video, let me know what you think of my ideas and what you think about what I think about the DCEU and what's happened to it. Whatever we say, whatever we stand, whoever we stand, it's just not a cohesive franchise anymore. Quarter of Snyder, then um, Hamada, 
it's, it's simply a bad fit. Now, I'm hoping that Flashpoint can fix these things. Now, in an ideal world, you could have Snyder and Hamada working together on this. But that's not happening. That ship has sailed. It's gone too far. I hope the DC live action franchise can be saved. But at this moment, I have my doubts. I'll see you again tomorrow.